Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Okay. So, got another big day today. Very excited. Um, lots of things to do. The model is evolving. So, with this extra time, um, I've had time to talk to some some good people, some creative thinkers that have that have helped drive me a little bit harder in regards to uh, evolving the model. So we've been working on some cool stuff. Um, you guys will obviously benefit from that at some point in time, as will the people that will attend the intensive if we ever get back to doing those thingies. All right. So anyway, oh, uh, happy birthday to my sister, Stacy. It is, I have no idea how old you are. Let me think. Uh, 53, 55, 56, are you 56? Holy cow. Okay, yeah, so mom's birthday was yesterday, Stacy's birthday today, and it's tax day. That's how you always remember Stacy's birthday because, um, you know, um, she was born and then you had to pay taxes. I don't know if there's a relationship there. We'll, we'll, we'll just let that play itself out. Um, so I got some questions. Obviously, from the, from the q and I'm trying to clean up the backup here. And this one comes from uh, my buddy Edward from, from Germany. Um, he, he wrote some really cool stuff about uh, how we influence breathing and how some of it is actually even meditative, which I thought was really, really cool. But, um, but the thing that, that he asked uh, um, in the Q&A is basically, how do you distinguish between genetically determined structure of being a narrow versus a wide? And a body that starts, for example, as a wide, does a ton of compressive hardcore weight work and, and results in a narrow with excessive external oblique and that has to deal with two or three layers of compensatory strategies overwhelming the body. Well, first and foremost, you're never going to turn a wide into a narrow or a narrow into a wide. Okay, what we're going to see are compressive strategies that may make things look a little bit differently, but the genetically predetermined structure is always going to be there. Think about this for a second. If I wanted to turn a narrow into a wide, I would have to I would have to smash them down. I would have to take away their height to change the helical angles. And so, so we're not actually doing that. What we're doing is we're probably bending a few things to make it look a little bit differently. So let me give you a for instance. Um, people uh, often will say that they had a narrow that, that is now a wide. The reality is it's just a it's just a shape change um, because of the superficial uh, musculature like rectus abdominis. And, and, and pecs um, behaving as such that they compress the axial skeleton. I can take a, a narrow, so when you lay your hands on, on a, a narrow, your, your hands might be in that shape right there, but if they do a lot of uh, compressive strength work, it'll start to square off in the front like that, but they'll still be a narrow. But because they're getting compressed flat, it will seem like the ISA is actually wider and it's not. So you still treat those people like a narrow. Um, it would be really, really difficult to take a wide individual and turn them into a narrow uh, to begin with once again because you can't change the helical angles, but because other than the external oblique, there is nothing on the, on the sides of the body that are squeezers uh, because we really don't have that plane um, to play in as, as humans. Um, point being though, because we're dealing with superficial strategies here, Ed, the thing you got to do is you got to get the ISA to move. So, so your your comment at the end of your of your question is yes, you have to get the ISA to move. But I will offer you this: the deeper that people go into these compensatory strategies, the more help they're going to need. So, chances are you're going to have to lay hands on them. You have to do some manual therapies to get the rib cage to move, because of the the compensatory strategies being exhale based. They are concentric orientation, and so you have to teach one side of the body to eccentrically orient as you compress the other. So you're actually gonna to have to increase the compressive strategy on one side of the body manually so they can eccentrically orient on the opposing side. Um, so start there, get your manual therapist. If you're, a, if you're a trainer or a coach in the gym, this is where um, laying people over pads over, over on, their, on their side to create a compressive strategy on one side and expand the other is where you're gonna be playing. Um, you can also use some some like a side bridge or side planking type activities with some active motion as they're breathing so you're creating compression expansion compression expansion so this is where some some dynamic stuff in the gym gets really really interesting um, because what what you're trying to do is restore sort of like that worm like quality uh, to, to the to the thorax so it can bend and turn and twist 
And so, so doing static holds under these circumstances is not necessarily the best choice. So people that are trying to lock the the rib cage and the abdomen into a place thinking that, oh, more stability is better, this is the exact wrong strategy under those circumstances. We want the rib cage to move. We want the spine to move. We want the pelvis to move. We always want to have that mobility available to us. So constantly training these, these anti-positions of anti-rotation, anti-bend, um, not always a good strategy, especially when you've already got somebody that's very, very rigid. All right, number two from Brian. And Brian says, if someone exhibits a narrow ISA with excessive lumbar lordosis and limited hip ER, would a good strategy to improve the hip ER measures be to work on activities to improve the lower posterior thorax expansion to reduce the, the, the lordosis, which is driving the anterior pelvis orientation? Brian, you are dead on, buddy. Okay, but, but let's talk about this a little bit because what we want to do is we want to make sure that, that we are, are reorienting the pelvis on the correct axis. So let me grab the pelvis real quick. So if we're talking about a narrow, um, we're, so we're, we're going to use the IPA here as the representation. So this is somebody that does not have full excursion of breathing, so they don't have full inhalation and exhalation because they've lost, lost hip motion, right? So I'm going to see a, a narrowing of this, of this IPA. Well, what this does, it's going to retrovert the, the acetabulum. So typically what, under these circumstances, what I should have is more ER, but your guy has lost, uh, lost ER. And so what that means is that we've got this anterior orientation of the pelvis. Now the question mark is, is it straightforward? So if I have a bite, if I have a symmetrical bilateral loss of ER, then you can pretty much be sure that, that I have a, almost a straightforward orientation. Um, typically, with a, with a narrow, you're not going to see a lumbar lordosis because I, I have sacral counternutation, and that's going to reduce the, the appearance of the lordosis in the lumbar spine. Chances are, I'm, so I'm, I'm taking a wild guess here, Brian, that if you're seeing a lordosis, that you're actually seeing a turn. And so, so what you got is a narrow with an anterior orientation and a, and a turn. And so what's going to happen is we're going to see this ischial tuberosity getting closer and closer to the femur. So what you're going to end up with is, chances are if you've lost ER by traditional measures at, with the hip at, at 90 degrees of, of hip flexion, you're probably also losing abduction at the same time. Then you know you're on an oblique axis there. And so you're going to have to push back on, on an oblique. So instead of trying to bring the pelvis straight back this way, you're actually going to push from the right and go back to the left. So you're going to push back on that oblique axis because chances are you lost more ER on the left than you did on the right. Okay. So, so again, I'm taking a little bit of a leap there based on the information that you gave me, but I'll just put that on the floor for now. Um, but but uh, if if I'm if I'm wrong about that, then please get back to me um, through the through the askbillhartman at gmail.com, and we will clarify um, what those needs actually are. So thank you for that, Brian. Okay, I got a question from Matt, and Matt says Matt made reference to a, a previous video. Uh, saw your recent tricep pushdown video. And notice that you say push through the pinky side of your hands. I was wondering why this is and, and how pressing different parts of your hand can have different influences on the rest of the body. Is it similar to pressing through different aspects of your foot? Absolutely. So Matt, you are, you are on point here. So um, if, we, if we look at the, the, the heel of the hand here, when we look at the pinky side, so this is like, this would be like a uh, pisiform um, general vicinity or the, the uh, hypothenar eminence, if you will. So when I apply pressure there, that promotes an external rotation from, from the, the hand and wrist towards the shoulder, which would give me posterior expansion or dorsal rostral expansion. So if that's my goal, if I'm trying to maintain expansion of that area, I want to maintain pressure there because the minute that I put pressure through the, the thenar side of the, of the heel of the hand or the thumb side of the heel of the hand, I am working on an exhalation strategy, which will get me anterior expansion. So let me give you an example of when this typically shows up. You're probably already doing this and not even recognizing it as you do a push-up. So if I'm at the very, very top of the push-up, I tend to put weight through the, the, the hypothenar aspect of the heel of the hand, 
right? And then as I am in the lowest part of the push-up and I'm about ready to create my propulsive phase, I'm actually going to pronate into the ground. So I'm pressing the thumb side of the heel of the hand into the ground to push myself back up. So, so we have this transition from inhale to exhale through the push-up. So now we have a potential solution for your clients that are having trouble with push-ups. So the people that cannot get depth, the people that can't get depth, in their push-ups cannot capture this propulsive strategy um, at the bottom, which is why they can't produce enough force. So they never access that range of motion through the push-up. So, so now you can think about, okay, that's one of the reasons why you elevate these people is so they can learn to capture these different positions of inhalation and exhalation so they can manage the pressures that allow them to produce force. So Matt, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I, I appreciate everybody with the Q&A. So ask Bill Hartman at gmail.com. So keep the questions coming. Have an outstanding Wednesday. I'm going to go finish off my neural coffee. And then um, we'll, we'll see you um, all over social media today. So I'll see you guys later.